have your Bibles today, will you open them up to Matthew chapter 24? Matthew chapter 24, this is the first time in 17 months that we are not turning to Matthew 5, 6, or 7, as we are just concluded last week, an extended series on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which was just so refreshing, so rewarding, as we walked through the longest single recorded teaching from Jesus that covered Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, uh, and now today, we're kind of in a unique spot. We just finished this series and uh, most of you, are, if you've been here the last few weeks, are aware of this. If you haven't been here, here's new information to you. Uh, after today, uh, my wife and I, we are taking a, a brief mini sabbatical. We're going to be gone for the next month, uh, just taking a, a bit of a rest, a breather. We've uh, just been uh, offered by uh, our board to take a month to just kind of catch up and uh, rest after this, these last four years of just giving all we've got to the building of this church. And uh, again, for you guys to know, we are doing so well. We're not burnt out. We, we're not lacking vision. We're not wondering what's going to happen with our lives. We're ready to give the next, we said 30 years, so we're down to 26 years of our lives to this church. Uh, but we're ready to, to take a little bit of a breather and come back and give it all that we got. And uh, you guys are going to be in great hands. I'm excited for you guys to hear uh, from some of the rest of our team over the next few weeks. Uh, but that puts us in a bit of a unique spot where we just finished this 17-month series. And, uh, and I'm about to, to take a few weeks off. And so we got like one week to just share something that's, that's on my heart. And I've kind of been considering, okay, we just finished Sermon on the Mount. Last week we talked about going back down the mountain. What do we do after hearing this information? And how do we now put it into practice as followers of Jesus? And kind of considering like what's next? What do, we, what do we take uh, in consideration of, of what we just talked through? How do we build on that? What's life when we go back down the mountain? So today, uh, we've got one week where we're going to spend some, some time on, on a thought. Uh, this may be an eventual series down the road, but we're just going to, uh, I, I have a problem. Maybe you guys have already noticed this. I've got a lot of problems. One I'm going to tell you about uh, is I always have way more to say than I have time to say. Uh, that's just, I like to talk. And you start studying something, you're like, this should be another 17-month series. But we're going to just kind of get a bit of a dump today. This may eventually be uh, a longer series. Um, but today it's going to be uh, a topical message. If you uh, are familiar with church and with teaching, there's two primary forms of teaching. There's other ones. But topical is what it sounds like. There's a, a topic that you want to consider, and you look at what does Scripture teach about this topic. The other is expository. Expository is where you just choose a chunk of Scripture, sometimes a whole book of the Bible, and you just walk through, and the topic is whatever next in, in that scripture, which is what we've done in the Sermon on the Mount. The last 17 months have been expository. Today's going to be more topical. So we're going to look at a few different scriptures, but I want to start in Matthew chapter 24, and uh, we'll jump to a few other ones. Uh, we do our best to put all the scriptures we reference on the screen. If you brought your Bible, we always encourage you to bring your own Bible. It gives you a chance to take some notes and to highlight in it, uh, but we're going to start in, in Matthew chapter 24. Here, uh, Matthew chapter 24, we are two days before Jesus uh, goes and has the Last Supper at the Passover meal uh, with his disciples. Uh, after the Last Supper, he's going to go pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be betrayed by Judas, get arrested, falsely accused, beaten, uh, put on trial. He's going to be whipped and scourged, and then the next day he's going to be nailed to the cross, and he's going to die. And three days later, he's going to come back from, from the dead. So we are at the tail end of Jesus' ministry here in chapter 24. We spent the last 17 months looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which is at the very beginning. So we, we uh, are, are three years later now in Jesus' ministry, and uh, he is nearing the end of his life. And so these are some of the last words that he communicates to his disciples. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 24 says this, Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when will all of this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And from that question, Jesus then goes on this long discourse. If you have your Bible open, if you're a red letter Bible, the, next, uh, the rest of chapter 24 and all of chapter 25 is now, uh, I didn't look at it, it's got to be like the second or third longest teaching of Jesus in Scripture. What's interesting to note, I didn't notice this till studying this week, is he's once again sitting on the mountainside speaking to his disciples. Uh, so this, this, uh, this might be the other Sermon on the Mount series we get to post-sabbatical. Uh, but there's this amazing teaching here now at the end of Jesus' life where he's again on a mountainside communicating some difficult truths to his followers. The question that's posed is, when is the end of time going to be? When are you going to return? 
Uh, there's a lot to, to dig into here that we're not going to take time today. I want to zero in on one sentence and uh, one word in that sentence specifically. But let's read the beginning of Jesus' reply. He says in verse 4 that Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. If you have your Bible, if you're an underliner, a highlighter, verse 13 is where we're zeroing in on today. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And if you want to highlight one specific word, we're going to look at the word endurance today. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Um, I read this text and I realize I've got a, another problem. You send me the number for your therapist. I just got a list of issues to deal with. Um, one of them is like, we have one week to just preach whatever you want. And for some reason, I'm just drawn to like really challenging texts. Like this is, this is a tough one to read. She's like, hey, it's going to get bad. And then it's going to get worse. <laughs> and then people are going to hate you. And some of you are going to get killed. And sin is going to be rampant everywhere. There's going to be lots of false teaching. It's going to be a real challenge. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And as you're enduring through the challenges of the world and the circumstances and the chaos uh, of the, the cultures that you live in, it's like when you endure, the gospel is going to be preached. And I'm calling you as my followers here at the end, and they're just about to watch Jesus get beaten and killed and know that this is going to be a, a, an eventual future that they're going to walk into, and he encourages them with the statement, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Endurance. I, I read that, and you know what? Uh, I personally, and as a church, like I hope we are those that endure to the end. What good is this if we don't endure to the end and experience the salvation and, and the eternity that God has promised to us? If we just had like seasons of spirituality and, and we didn't endure to the end? That although life may be difficult and there's going to be trials and challenges and circumstances around us and culture is going to build to a place where sin, you look and sin is rampant, sin is commonplace, sin becomes acceptable and there it begins to be uh, teaching uh, that, that it is, is against the holiness of God and it becomes the commonplace. And he's like, this is going to continue to happen, but I want to be of those that although this is happening around us, that we are those that finish well. That we are people who hold on to our faith, we hold on to conviction, and we don't just live seasonally as spiritual people, but we finish the race well. Endurance, by definition, is the ability or the strength to continue. Despite fatigue, despite stress, despite adverse conditions, you continue. It's, it's building stamina to finish well. When we are doing something that requires endurance, endurance by definition is making it to that finish line. That is what success of endurance looks like. That it doesn't really matter how well you start or how good your pace is halfway through the race. It is, are you running in such a way where you can finish well? I want us to consider uh, even examples in your life that require endurance. What does it look like to be a people of endurance? Now, I know we live in western Montana, and we got a lot of physically active people. So maybe you've had, like, physically active feats of endurance. I know we got people who run, who bike, who swim, who hike, who kayak, you name it. Like, there may be feats of, like, to, it, it, there is adversity, that I'm running out of energy, there is fatigue, but I'm going to continue on. Maybe you've got examples in your own life of what it means to press on in acts of endurance. I don't think all acts of endurance are necessarily necessarily physically active like that. Maybe you've got acts of endurance that you can think of in your life. Maybe it's education. I know we have people in the room who have gone to school for a lot of years, that you've made it through law school, you've made it through medical school, that you've had feats of endurance uh, in your education. 
For some, it's projects that you've had at, at your place of work, or it's uh, projects around the house where it's like it just took faithfulness to continue on, even though there's fatigue, stress, or adverse conditions. Uh, for some of the ladies in the house, pregnancy, it is adverse conditions, it is fatigue, it is stress, but you continue on. Parents in the house, you uh, have learned that there is parenting parts that are just, it requires endurance. You just keep going. You're faithful. Uh, we've got uh, entrepreneurs in the room. We've got those who have started your own businesses, and, and you're continually on this learning curve of how do you continue on. But endurance is when you have the ability, because there is a vision, there is a purpose that despite fatigue, despite stress, you continue on so that you can finish well. I think um, there's a lot of spiritual application to endurance, and uh, again, this may end up being a, a longer teaching at some point, uh, and we're not going to take the time today to make all of these spiritual applications to physical endurance, but I want to start by just considering some, some physical endurance and how it relates to our spiritual life, and then we're going to dig into a few of these scriptures here. Um, endurance, as many of you experience, endurance requires nourishment, not just drive. Uh, the importance of fueling yourself. Like, the, your inputs are often dictated, uh, often dictate your outputs. That it, endurance is not just about how much effort you put forth. It's are you fueling yourself? Are you getting the inputs necessary so that you can keep going when things get difficult? There's so much spiritual application of not just are you driven to maintain your faith, but what are the consistent inputs you're putting into your life so that you have the fuel to keep going? Uh, I was thinking about endurance, and uh, if you've ever done something that takes a lot of endurance, any individual segment of that effort of endurance isn't that impressive. You know, if you are running, it's just you're putting another foot in front of the other, and, and it's not that impressive. If you're biking, if you're hiking, if whatever it is, it's, it's not any individual segment that's all that impressive. It's the fact that you continue that motion over and over and over, and you're tired, but you find a way to keep going and endure. It is, it is doing that continued repetition that isn't all that impressive by itself over the expanse of time that becomes impressive. I'll tell you that maintaining our faith, spiritual applications are rampant here. Then maybe you take individual segments and it doesn't look that impressive, but what is impressive is when you just keep maintaining faith. You don't quit, you don't get derailed by the next thought or where culture is going, or when you're getting a little bit stagnant, or it's not as fun as it was in the beginning, but you continue to press on uh, over an expanse of time. If you've done anything that requires endurance, maybe you experience that endurance can be lonely. The further you go, the thinner the crowd gets. What's odd about endurance um, is that uh, if you're at a race, an endurance race, the starting line is packed and there's lots of excitement and everyone's ready to roll. Um, and maybe there's spots throughout the race where you get a couple cheers, and there's people waiting at the finish line. But most of the race, nobody's watching. Nobody knows if you're going hard. No one knows if you're taking it easy. No one knows. And what's interesting even beyond that is there's nobody at the starting line or the finish line of all of the training that happens before race day. And when you're out there training, nobody cares uh, if you slow down, if you take a shortcut, you call it quits, you skip the run, or you stop training altogether. What makes these endurance efforts so meaningful is that you have set a goal, you've set a, a desire, a finish line, a vision, and even when nobody is watching, you choose to keep going. Even if it's not impressing anybody, even if it's not as exciting as it was when you started, and even if you, you don't know if anyone's there cheering you on, what, what it takes is saying, even though nobody's watching, nobody's looking, my faith means so much to me, that I'm going to be faithful in these moments where nobody even sees. See, it's easy to run fast when people are cheering and watching. But what does our endurance look like when we're out there miles into it? There's no one around. No one knows if we're taking it easy. No one knows if we're compromising. No one knows if we're giving less than our best. And we choose to remain faithful even though we're tired. There's fatigue, adverse conditions. We keep going. I want to look at some scriptures that speak to this and uh, make a few uh, spiritual applications here. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 1, uh, if you look back at chapter 11, it's, it's what we know is like the hall of faith. It's, it's this list of incredible people of faith throughout scripture. Uh, and these are people who didn't just like live perfect lives. In fact, they had some really low lows. Uh, but these are people that are celebrated for their faith, not because of the morality of their lives, but because they maintained faith until death, that they finished 
well. Regardless of the stints of their, their race that were good and those that were bad, they finished well. So it says, going into chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, since we're surrounded by those who have gone before us and have finished well, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with what? Endurance. The race God has set before us. I want to tell you, um, there is a race that God has set before you, and the race that he has chosen to set before you requires endurance. I don't know if you could like pick your own metaphor for what you'd like a life following Jesus to look like. Uh, that would be nice if we could pick our own. Maybe it would be like a slow Saturday morning, a nice stroll in somewhere beautiful. Um, but the metaphor that we get for following Jesus is not just a race, but an endurance race. I don't know, um, physically speaking, uh, if you're a runner or not, but spiritually speaking, if you've chosen to follow Jesus, you are an endurance runner. The race that God has set before us, it's a race, and it's not a 100-meter dash. It is a long, the rest of our days, continuing on, regardless of adverse conditions, we continue to follow him. We maintain faith, and we run the race that he's marked out for us. Uh, what I want to highlight about endurance today is um, if you set the goal of, I'm going to go run a marathon, you don't just get off the couch and go run it that day. What you start doing is you start putting into practice those principles that will help build you into the person that could do in the future something you can't do today. That uh, you start building on that. That's what I love about endurance, about stamina, is that it is built, that it grows, that you can invest in it and it become more in the future than it is today. Uh, so what does it look like for us to continually take small steps today to get us closer to becoming the type of people that could do in the future what we can't do today? How does endurance grow? In the New Testament, there's 47 times where this, this word about endurance or perseverance is, is, is brought up. 47 teachings. Again, that means a whole series. We're not going to be able to look at 47 teachings today. But what does it look like in Scripture to endure and how do we grow and build this, this type of stamina? Romans chapter 5 is where I want to look first. Starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore... Since we have been made right with God, we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, God has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. I want to pause right there for a second. Uh, I, I love what these, these couple of verses kind of encapsulate for us. A couple of theological terms that we use frequently around here. It speaks to justification. Justification means uh, to be declared righteous. And what we read in Scripture is that because of what Jesus has done, as it says here in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, because Jesus, uh, that he lived the life that we couldn't live, and he died the death that we should have died, that he did everything necessary to reconcile us to the Father. That we can't do the work, so Jesus did it on our behalf. And so it is his grace that he did what we couldn't do, and it is our faith, believing that he has done that, that restores us with the Father. And it puts us in an undeserved privilege of, of righteousness before God. That because of Jesus, we are seated in Christ. When the Father looks down at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. That is undeserved favor. And that's because of what happens when we are justified, when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus. Jesus Christ, we're declared righteous. And then it says, and we look forward to the hope of God's glory. This is another term we, we use often about glorification, that one day in eternity, we will embody the righteousness that has already been declared over us. That uh, we, we know that we've been declared righteous, but we see ourselves, we're not living out that righteousness. We are imperfect, growing in the likeness of Jesus in this life. But one day, our eternal state in the presence of God is we will embody that righteousness. So I love that this is where, where Paul starts here in Romans chapter 5. He says, because of the grace of God, we have undeserved favor of being right with God. And because we're right with God, we have a hope of being in the glory of God for eternity. So he starts with that premise as he jumps into verse 3. It says, so we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop what? Oh man, that was less than last time I asked you to say it. Maybe we'll get another chance. We'll see. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Saying when we have the hope that we've been declared righteous, and we know that that means that our eternity is secure, that we will be glorified. That means that when we're in this season of our life and trial comes our way, instead of the natural human response of freaking out and trying to eliminate it and just have the most peaceful life we can possibly have, we can look at the same trials. And instead of freaking out because everything in us just wants the most peaceful life possible, we look at trials and say, hey, this is actually a gift. This trial that I'm walking through has is giving me the opportunity to grow my endurance, to develop endurance inside of me. And when we are people of endurance in our faith, it's going to start affecting our character. We're going to start living like Jesus because we actually have hope that he has saved me. He's declared that I'm righteous. I got glorification awaiting me. And because this trial is developing endurance inside of me, it's changing my character. And as I see this character developing inside of me, my confidence that I actually am saved goes through the roof. And it's now this cycle of I see the beauty that can be found in the trials that most of humanity is trying to avoid. It is, it's growing endurance when we're facing trials. James says it this way in James chapter 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. Let it grow, let it grow. Shout out to all the parents of little girls in the 2010s who listen to Frozen over and over and over. It says it gives it a chance to grow. So let your endurance grow. Let it grow for when your endurance is developed, you'll be perfect. You'll be complete, needing nothing. Again, he's saying that endurance is built through trials. Uh, I think it's just important for us to know that endurance is necessary. Those who endure to the end will be saved. But endurance is not built in comfort but in trial. So how do we embrace, how do we build this endurance that those who endure to the end will be saved? I want that ingredient in my faith. I want to be someone who endures. The number one way that we see is you embrace the tests. You embrace the trials of life. I want to tell you that the trials that you face are not an indication of the abandonment of God, but it is an opportunity for you to grow and develop towards completion and perfection. It's too easy for us to see the inconveniences, the trials, the disappointments in life and point a finger at an unloving God in our minds rather than saying, God, I am certain that you have already sent your son to die on my behalf. You have reconciled me. I'm standing in undeserved favor. In the midst of the storm, I am standing in undeserved favor. And I'm confident of the glory that I have when this life is over. Therefore, I will not be convinced that this trial is, is a statement of your abandonment, but an opportunity that you are allowing for my endurance to build. We embrace the tests. I want to tell you our name, Anchor Church, Uh, implies in and of itself that there will be storms that we will have to endure. In fact, when we chose the name Anchor Church, coming from Hebrews chapter 6, it says that we have this hope, speaking of Jesus, that is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. From day one, that meant to us that there are going to be storms in this life that instead of being rescued out of them, we're going to have to stand strong and endure. By definition, an anchor means it will provide stability through the challenges. Scripture doesn't say that Jesus is the strong and trustworthy rescue helicopter that when anything is challenging will come and set you on a nice beach until the storm is over. No, he says he's an anchor. It means there's going to be storms, but you're going to make it. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be trials and challenges, but we are going to be of those that see the trial as an opportunity to build endurance, not to quit. The second way that we grow our endurance, we find it continuing on in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1 again says that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, so let's throw off the weight and the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Verse 2 starts by saying, we do this by, explaining how we run with endurance. Verse 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, who doesn't just initiate, but he perfects our faith. It says we keep looking at him. It says that uh, he is now seated at the place of honor. Beside God's throne, it says, think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people so that you won't grow weary and you won't give up. When we want to give up, when we're feeling worried, we're feeling beat down, when we're feeling like endurance is not what's for us, it says that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, when we consider what he endured, 
from sinful men, it's going to build inside of us the ability to endure. It's interesting to me, and I think it's, it's encouraging to me, that it, it doesn't say keep your eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects your faith, for the joy set before him, found the easiest route possible, and didn't have to go through difficult circumstances. It says this is how you're going to be encouraged by Jesus. You remember that there was a joy, a vision set before him that was so strong that he went through what was incredibly challenging. The joy set before him, the ability to be the sacrifice for mankind so that you could be reconciled to God. So that not only would he experience eternity reunited with the Father, but that you could find forgiveness, you could find redemption, and that you too could spend eternity glorified in the presence of God, that you could be a recipient of eternal life. He says because of that vision, because of that hope of glory with you, he was willing to go through not what was the easiest route, but the trials that were coming his way. And so when we feel like giving up, we remember that Jesus has already gone before us, the ultimate endurance runner, going through every possible trial, that could ever come his way, and he went through it with joy, not because it was easy, but because eternity with you was on the other side. Remember, Jesus already endured to be with you. Like He is the goal. He is the finish line. He is the vision. The God, we want to be of those that endure to the end, and we come face to face with our Savior who already crossed that finish line. He has already done everything necessary, and we get to behold him face to face for eternity. It says consider him, remember him through the ups and downs of life. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the goal, and he's the sustenance. Now, in these last few minutes, um, we're going we're gonna to transition to application. Okay, what do we do? How do we build uh, endurance in ourselves? Um, I'm convinced that uh, oftentimes when we're trying to grow in one area of life, it's really helpful to find other areas of our lives to kind of grow in that same discipline. Uh, have you ever noticed that when you train in one area, it begins to impact other areas of your life? When you start getting discipline in one area, even finances like we, we talked about with Bo, uh, or maybe it's your physical fitness, when you start developing certain disciplines, it begins to affect other areas of your life. Uh, I think sometimes we, we can run into the struggle of, if, if I'm trying to develop endurance in one area, but we allow ourselves to quit easily in all the other areas of life, even if they seem unrelated, we're going to have a difficult time building endurance. I think there's some beauty in saying, hey, absolutely, this is a call to spiritual endurance. But what are some other ways that I can build and grow those muscles of endurance that will help me spiritually endure? Uh, everything is related, even if we feel like they're unrelated. Uh, f for example, uh, I'm at the point now where when anyone comes to me and says, hey, uh, I'm dealing with uh, an addiction to pornography, or uh, I've got the, these, these sexual lusts that I'm dealing with, these, these desires with my sexuality, well, when that, that topic is brought up, most commonly what is uh, expected is like, well, well here's, here's the counseling that you should receive. Here's the, the, the software you should put on your computers. Here's, here's all these forms of accountability, which are, are fine. Those are good. I think those are important. But uh, I'm at the point now where my first recommendation is like, if you want to deal with that, if you want to get rid of those desires of your flesh, you need to start fasting food. Uh, and, and your second thing is you need to memorize Psalms 51 which Psalm 51 is the psalm of David when he got caught committing adultery with Bathsheba and he cries out to God to, to, to purify his heart, to restore to me a pure heart and, and, and the joy of my salvation. And at sometimes the response is like, how does that have anything to do with my, my pornography addiction? Like, well, because we've been trained that our flesh, when it has a desire, it gets it. When, when I feel a craving coming in, we just feed it whatever it wants. And I think that uh, food is one of the most prominent ways that our flesh is consistently saying, I want something. Now I'm saying that you never eat again, but I think there's a habit of developing that I'm going to learn that sometimes my flesh wants something and it doesn't get it. Because if we're not training in other areas of life, if the only way you're trying to tell your flesh it doesn't get what it, what it wants is when it comes to a, that of a sexual nature, uh, but it gets everything it wants the rest of the time, it's going to be difficult to overcome. So I think there's a flexing of that same muscle, the ability to say no in other areas of life that help you say no in the one area you're really focused on. And, and memorizing Psalm 51, well, that's important because you're not going to do that in an hour. You're not going to do it in a day. It is developing a consistency of going back and adding a little bit 
bit at a time and a little bit at a time and learning endurance, not just I can resist for a day, but I'm developing new patterns. And although they may seem unrelated, I think it's incredibly related to start building these disciplines of saying no in other areas so that the one area you're focusing on, those muscles can be strengthened. So similarly, when it comes to endurance, absolutely the call is that we are those that endure our faith to the end. But I'm convinced that when we start building the endurance muscles in other areas of life, it affects our spirituality. I do believe that they are related. Now the goal of this is not, okay, everybody go run a marathon and you make it to heaven. The goal is maintain your faith. But what can we do in other areas of our life that begin to build and stretch those muscles? Um, I think uh, we've probably seen it in some areas. If it is, you know, a discipline to, to... uh, a certain diet or it's a discipline to exercise or to, to lose some weight or to, to run a certain race. It, not only does it start affecting that uh, specifically, but it starts affecting our diet. It starts affecting your hydration. It starts affecting your sleep patterns. It starts affecting uh, your, your time management to get out there and get that training in. It starts affecting your, your financial priorities because it's like, man, these shoes are killing me. I need to go get actual running shoes. I need to uh, figure out how to fuel my body better. Like, it begins with a simple discipline of like, I'm going to try to achieve this goal, but it so quickly begins to uh, formulate in other areas of your life. So here's what we're going to do. This is um, a very different way to conclude a message. Um, The call is to endure in our faith, that we wouldn't quit, we'd finish the race. But I want to challenge you, in these last few minutes we have together, I want to challenge you to commit to an act of endurance, one spiritual, one physical, that is going to help build those muscles to endure when challenges come your way. I want you to think of something that uh, to do it today would be difficult, if not impossible, for you to do, and uh, make a commitment to do it. Let's start spiritually, and then it's going to be so weird to just end with the most practical. You need to go run a lap somewhere, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, Spiritually, what do we do to develop spiritual endurance? First and foremost, it's how do we create habits and rhythms in our life that help us keep our eyes on Jesus? I want you to first consider that question. What is it? What are elements in your life that when you're there in that moment, it helps you see Jesus, to focus on him, his love for you, his call on your life? What is it? That, that helps you fix your eyes on Jesus, and how do we commit to something stronger in that lane than what we're doing right now? I think a very obvious one would be reading the Word of God. I don't know your pattern. I'm not comparing you to anybody else. But what is a, a reading the Bible uh, commitment that is so much loftier than what you're doing right now? For some of you, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to make this decision for you, but some of you, you need to read the whole New Testament in the next month. It's not impossible. It's just you got to read a little bit every day. Some of you, you need to read the Gospels to see Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you want to read, you, you're going to commit to reading through all four Gospels in a week, and you're going to do it six straight weeks to see Jesus. It's not impossible for anybody in here to do it, but we need to make some sort of commitment uh, of how are we going to see Jesus. Um, I, I do think a Bible commitment plan is, is really valuable. And I don't know what a lot for you is, but how do you see Jesus clearly uh, through Scripture? And how do you make your, commit yourself to doing something that today, it's not a pattern that you have, but you're going to develop some endurance? Some of you, maybe it is memorizing a chapter of the Bible. Psalms 51 is a great one. I don't know where it is, but like, it's something where I'm going to have to go back to consistently, and I'm going to give myself this amount of time to memorize this much. Some of you, uh, this isn't about church attendance, but... Some of you being in moments like this really helps you see Jesus better. And yet, a commitment to being in settings like this is just if there's nothing else going on. What's it look like for you to commit? Like for the next six months, the doors are open. I'm there. Like I'm going to put myself in positions to see Jesus, to fix my eyes on him so that I can grow in my endurance. Maybe it's actually taking a step of commitment to the church body. Maybe it's filling out that ready-to-connect form and getting involved in a group or signing up to a service team. Like, what is it that's going to say, this is going to help me commit uh, to fix my eyes on Jesus? As the band comes up, um, I also want to challenge you. I'll let you make up your own commitment spiritually to endure. But I actually want to challenge you to do something physical at the same time that's really challenging for you to do. And again, this isn't about comparing ourselves amongst ourselves. We got different ages and different body types and different health. So this isn't about uh, setting the same goal for everybody. But I want you to consider what would be challenging for you to do physically that you're gonna commit to, to build those muscles of endurance that 
you put yourself in a position where there's fatigue and you don't stop so that we can learn to do this spiritually as well. For some of you, it might be running, jogging, walking a mile. For some of you, it might be signing up for a 5K or a 10K or a half marathon or a full marathon or an ultra marathon or an Ironman. I don't know who you are, but you're crazy. I don't know what it is for you that's endurance. It's not about what's endurance for somebody else. What is it for you? Some of you, it is like you're going to make it to the M. And you might make it to the first switchback this weekend. And next weekend, you might make it to the next one. But what does it look like to start doing today the practices and recognizing, well, if I'm going to do that, I need to go buy myself a knee brace. Uh, I don't know what it is. But how do you start putting into practice ways to develop endurance when things are difficult? You don't just coast for the easiest route possible, but you recognize what is trial is the opportunity for endurance. Some of you might be 10 push-ups, might be 1,000 push-ups. For some of you, it's not even actually a physical effort like that. But maybe it is. You're going to study that course. You're going to get that house project done that's going to take some faithfulness and some commitment and some adjustments with your time and your finances. Some of you, maybe it's actually writing that letter that you've been thinking about for a long time, but it's too easy to put it off. Maybe some of you, you're going to go buy yourself a thousand-piece puzzle and sit down and do it. I love puzzles. My wife won't let me do them. One a year, Christmas time. It's great. Maybe you play an instrument. It's time to learn that song or write that song. Maybe it's a financial. You're going to hit that savings goal or you're going to pay off that debt. But I honestly believe that um, we need to... I just want to be of those that finish well. So how do we embrace opportunities to build endurance? And I think we do it spiritually, and I think we do it physically, and I think you'll be so, um, I don't know if surprised, but it's pretty amazing when you're doing something that requires physical endurance to begin just considering the spiritual implications that it has. Like I'm out here, nobody sees this, and it's tough, but I'm going to keep going. And just developing that muscle of, man, Faithfulness is not about impressing the people around me. Faithfulness is not about when I'm at church worshiping like the people around me worship. And and it's about like when nobody's watching, do I have the conviction to keep going? I think you're going to find a lot of spiritual application to even physical efforts. So here's what we're going to do. Um, This is only to like help you solidify what you're going to do. We're actually going to have you text the word endurance to our, our number here. And this is not to like hold it over you. And be like, did you do it? No, get out. Uh, this is what we want to do. I, I feel like if you like write something down, it like solidifies it. And if you tell somebody else, it solidifies it even more. So this is simply what we're going to do. If you text the word endurance to our, our church text number, it's going to give you a, an auto reply for a link. And all it's going to ask you for is your name, your email. Those are required in the form that we use. And just like, what is something you're committing to spiritually? What's something you're committing to in endurance physically? And uh, for one, I think that just solidifies a decision. I think it'd be easy to just leave here and be like, yeah, I should think of that. And then we don't. Uh, And it's also going to give a chance for someone on our team to say, hey, we're praying for you. We're believing in you. I think it'll be really cool to share with each other. Like, hey, these are things that our church is doing. People have just read the New Testament for the first time in their lives. And they're seeing Jesus better. Uh, I just want to to have a chance to celebrate what God's doing. outside of this little bit of time we have on Sunday mornings together. So again, if you text that, you're going to get an auto reply. And as the band sings this last song, uh, I just want to encourage you to pray and consider what is something spiritually, what is something physically that's going to help develop and flex those muscles of endurance. I don't know what follow-up's going to look like. It's hilarious. I'm asking you to commit to something and then I'm taking a month off. (laughs) So you guys work hard. No, I'm with you. Uh, I've got an endurance commitment. I'm running 100 miles this month while I'm not here. Uh, That's what my plan is. I'm not telling you how fast or slow, uh, but we're going to do it. Uh, I want to encourage you to do it. So, uh, Lord, we just come before you right now. First and foremost, we thank you for your love and your grace. We're thankful that because of what Jesus has done, we can be viewed as righteous by the Father. Lord, we pray for anybody in the room today who came here today and they're not a follower of Jesus, don't consider themselves a Christian. Lord, I just ask that your goodness, your grace, would be experienced today. Lord, that today would be a day of salvation, even on a topical message on endurance. We consider you who endured such opposition so that we could be made right with you. We pray that today would be a day of faith for some. 
that today would be a day where they look to you and there is forgiveness for the sins of this life and there is hope for eternity with you. God, we just ask that today would be a day of salvation. Lord, we pray that um, over the course of this next weeks and months, Lord, that we would be a people that just build the stamina to be faithful to the end. Lord, we don't want to be a church that has just seasons of spirituality. We want to be a church and a people who finish this race well, that those who endure to the end will be saved. So Lord, we want to grow in that area to be those that to endure the storms and the trials. We love you. So grateful for your presence here today. It's your name we pray. Amen. We're going to release in just a minute. Um, if you haven't texted in yet, I encourage you to do that. Uh, maybe just consider what does it look like for you to, to commit to something. We'll dismiss it in just a moment. Uh, but you can stand and worship if you'd like. Uh, you can sit there and continue to, to pray through what God has for you as far as endurance. But uh, we'll dismiss in just a moment.